Welcome to the Everyday Discernment Podcast, a member of the Charisma Podcast Network and the Edify Podcast Network. This is episode 48. I really hope you checked out last week's episode with Aaron Schust. We had a great conversation about his journey in the music industry, and he talked about the importance of observing the Sabbath. This week, I have no new Patreon supporters to recognize, but I would like to point you that direction if you would like to support what I'm doing and also receive some pretty cool benefits for doing that. You can check out the different tiers of support at patreon.com slash discerning dad. Season one of this podcast will be wrapping up here in a few weeks, and I have an awesome season two already lined up for you. And I would like to hear from you. What did you enjoy from season one? Who was your favorite guest? And also, what would you like to see in season two? Email me at discerningdad at outlook.com. And for today's episode, I'm talking to Mike Golay. You're going to hear about him as well as the organization that he helps run called Behold Israel. I also want to apologize during this conversation. I had a little bit of a sore throat, and you'll hear that in the audio. Let's get right to it. Welcome to the Everyday Discernment Podcast. This show is about you and your walk with Jesus as we grow in discernment together so that we can make better daily decisions that honor God in all we do. We will align all things against the Bible and give you practical steps to run your Christian race to win. And now your host, the discerning dad, Tim Ferrara. Welcome to the Everyday Discernment Podcast. I am excited today. I have a guest on. His name is Mike Golay. He is the Director of Operations of Behold Israel. Prior to this, Mike was the lead pastor in Minnesota for over 17 years. In addition to his role with Behold Israel, he serves as a chaplain in the United States Air Force Reserve. Pastor Mike lived and worked in Israel for over eight years and has led numerous ministry teams, including Jesus Film Projects in the Galilee region. He is also proficient in Hebrew and has extensive experience with Jewish culture. He and his Israeli wife have three children, and they reside in Minnesota. Mike, welcome to the show. How are you? Thank you so much, Tim. It's an honor to be with you today. Yeah, thanks so much for coming on. And just give everyone a little more background about yourself. Anything else you want to share? Well, I love traveling. I love going to different cities around the world. I love speaking. Uh, It's a passion of mine to speak on prophecy. But in my spare time, it may sound crazy, but I love to go bowling with my family, hiking. Uh, I love uh, marksmanship with um, firearms. I love that. And I love serving my country. And I love people, Tim. I really love people. I love hearing people's stories and sitting in long winter evenings in log cabins in northern Minnesota and hanging out. I also like food, and uh, it shows. Awesome. Yeah, we were just talking about the difference in temperature. You know, you're about 40s right now, and I'm about 80s, so a little bit different north and south of the America here. Go ahead and give everyone a little overview of what Behold Israel is and kind of what you do for them. So it's all in the title, Behold Israel. We want people to behold that which is Israel, the apple of God's eye, the blossoming fig tree, the epicenter, the hub of prophecy. We, before COVID, did tours so people could literally behold Israel. We have switched to media, multimedia, and social media, and we provide videos and teaching, often on site, Tim. And we do a lot of international speaking about the times, about prophecy, and of course, about Israel. So, Behold Israel is to bring an awareness to the world that God is on the move in this country by resuscitating it and moving it towards its ultimate fulfillment with the end times promises. Mm. That's great. I would love to take a tour of Israel someday. That's on my bucket list. And uh, it's cool. You can do a a virtual tour, you're saying. There are virtual tours. What we do, Tim, is we'll, we'll film like a Bible teaching at a specific site, and then we'll have different camera crews go and really show where those things are. And it's really uh, a very well received uh, these projects we've been doing. We've done several already. We're working on another one right now. What's really difficult is to do like uh, virtual tours. I know some people have tried, some Israeli sites have tried. They're, it's just not the same, Tim. It, it yeah. just cannot emulate the actual experience of being there. So I hope and pray that you'll be able to go sometime. 
Yeah, me too. That'd be awesome. And Behold Israel also provides news updates. Uh, you have a podcast. There's sermons from uh, founder Amir. So you have a lot of cool resources on there as well as daily updates. Uh, so it's great. It's something definitely people can check out and kind of stay up to date. I would say a bunch of news you don't hear on <laughs> news oh, sites in America, correct? That is correct. We uh, have graduated a long time ago in our confidence of mainstream media a long time ago. In fact, it was one of the reasons why we chose to do it ourselves is we mm -hmm. can report actual facts on the ground as they're actually happening and people's actual intents, as opposed to the framed, uh, you know, I'd say even fake news coming out. So yeah. we do offer daily news. We also are on Telegram, and that is a gold mine because Amir is reporting about the situation there, especially with Iran. Mm. Saudi Arabia, the situation in the entire Middle East, key information. Uh, but again, Tim, it's it's all related to prophecy and connecting it to the Bible times. Yeah, that's great. So tell us, uh, when did you become a Christian? Did you grow up in a Christian home? What kind of influences did you have? Well, my parents did the best they could to raise me in a Catholic uh, family. Uh, I didn't uh, receive it very well. I went the opposite direction into the world and did everything uh, wrong you can think of. And at 18, I came to faith on a dare. A friend and I were out committing crime one night. He said, I'm sick of this. I'm going to go to church. I thought he was joking. I said, if you go to church, pick me up and I'll go. He actually did. I kept my word. The following week, we were in a Bible study by the invite of the youth pastor. I came to faith in the second booth to the right on the entrance of the Prior Lake, Minnesota Burger King on February 20th, 1987 at uh, 7.30 a.m. Wow. That's awesome. <laughs> and I haven't looked back since, Tim. Yeah. And you were a pastor for many years. What was that like? And, and when did you become a pastor? Yeah, almost 17 years. I was living in Israel at the time. And our church that I was saved in, that I came to faith in, they invited me to uh, start another campus. Uh, they had one campus and they outgrew it. So I took them up on the offer. That was in 2003. We moved back from uh, Israel to the United States in Minnesota. And we uh, planted this church called Friendship Church in Shakopee, Minnesota. <laughs> and there I was until I came on to Behold Israel at the end of 2018 in a volunteer role and then on a full-time role, 2019. What years did you live in Israel? I lived in Israel from 95 to 2003. Actually, awesome. yeah, 94, really. Yeah. Yeah. And you met your wife there? I did. I met her there, and we actually were married at the site of Armageddon. It's called Tel Megiddo, and there is the site of Armageddon, and uh, we rented it. It was beautiful, Wow! and uh, I trust that, that that's not a prophecy of how my marriage will end yeah. up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. no, it, it was fun. <clears throat> it was fun, yeah. So she is from there. She's, she's an Israeli, yeah. I like in Amir's book, he starts it off by saying he, I think he was looking over the site of Armageddon from his window and kind of talking about what was to come in that area. Is that the same area? It is. It is. If you go out to his deck, really looking out, you are looking at the Jezreel Valley, mm. which is the valley of Armageddon. In fact, the word Armageddon comes from the Hebrew, Har Megiddo, Har Megiddo, Armageddon. Mm. And Hal means mountain, Megiddo is the city, and that's the city I was married in. Solomon fortified it. It was also an ancient Canaanite city. It's a very old city. It was at the crossroads of the whole uh, valley, of the Jezreel Valley, from caravans from east, west, north, and south. So that's he's so right cool. there in the valley. Yeah, that's great. And I, I, you know, I think understanding, I'm sure you get this a lot on the, tr the tours you would run in Israel is just understanding the history of the area really gives you a, a deeper perspective of the Bible. And it's kind of the difference, you know, if you're in America reading a commentary Bible versus just reading the Bible, which the Bible's all sufficient, of course, but there's so much more depth to it when you understand the people, the places, the particulars of what you're reading, that it's actually a book of history also. And I think there's so much more that you can learn. I mean, we're always learning. You can never learn everything there is to learn in the Bible. But at the same time, 
the the more depth you put into studying the Bible, I think there's a, a more richness to it. Would you agree? Oh, I couldn't agree with you more, Tim. It is a huge privilege that I've had in living there, not just touring many times and leading tours, but to live there and to behold Israel, literally. Yeah. You get into some of the most interesting situations when you go and visit place to place and you learn new things, especially the cultural items that pop out of the text of the Bible once you understand the climate, the temperature, the, the the context of where it's where certain things are located. Everywhere you go, it just makes the Bible like 4K, mm. or shall I say 8K, 8K <laughs> yeah. now with the new resolutions coming out. Right. I remember black and white TV. Yeah. And you can you can understand, you can watch black and white TV. You can get the gist of a movie. I mean, it's it's clear, but when you move to 8K with uh, surround sound. Tim, you, I don't need to say anything. You, you, it just puts a whole nother level to the experience. And that's how I would compare Israel to, to Bible understanding. Yeah, that's a great analogy. I love that. So I'm going to ask you a few icebreakers. I ask all my guests to kind of connect with you a little more. So what would you say your favorite movie of all time is? Well, my favorite movie is probably Star Wars because that's uh, when I was young. My father took, that, took me to that movie. I collected all the action figures and Incidentally, um, they were sold in a garage sale when I was in college, and uh, I grieved greatly because I could have made some extra money selling <laughs> them off now. But I, I loved the, the, the drama, the theme. Um, not, not, not a fan of the, some of the new age philosophies. You know, I have to make that disclaimer. So yeah. n- not all movies are, are perfect. So I, there, there's the imperfection there. Sure. And they kind of ruined the series over time. So, <laughs> yeah, I agree. Yeah, it, they took it too far. They stretched yeah. the rubber band too far, and it, I think it snapped. Yeah. All right. If you could meet anyone alive or dead, who would it be? Well, if, 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 uh, obviously, if I could meet Jesus, I would. But if I couldn't meet him, yeah. Um, I would love to meet some of the, the past presidents. Um, I would love to meet Abraham Lincoln. Yeah. I'd just love to sit and I have, I would have a gazillion questions. I know, I know he struggled with depression. I, I, I would love to hear how he pushed through that. What uh, challenging decisions he had to make in his day. Yeah. Um, the quotes that he has are just riveting. So uh, Abraham Lincoln would be a huge, huge blessing if I could ever meet him in yeah. heaven. I will. Yeah, there I, you go. Yeah, he was so inspirational. He failed so many times in his life and he never gave up. And he finally became president after failing so many times in other offices where anyone else could have just said, I guess it's not for me. But the fact that he persisted and now we can talk about him today because of him not giving up. <laughs> yeah, he 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 resonates with humanity, I think, more than somebody just born successful and everything they touch is turns to gold. Yeah, for sure. What about an author you would recommend? Or, or a book? Uh, I love my brother-in-law, Amir Tsulfati, and <laughs> uh, any of those books <laughs> are phenomenal. And I say that uh, genuinely. Yeah. Um, otherwise, there's a host of great authors out there. Um, I, 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 I may sound really old school, Tim, when I say this, but I used to read a lot of Chuck Swindoll. Mm. Chuck Swindoll, I don't know if you've ever heard of him. He's yep. more my generation. But when I first came to faith, his commentaries launched me into what I would call a very firm understanding of scripture. And I owe him a lot of what I've taught over the years, really. Yeah, that's great. A lot of wisdom there. What about hobbies? Uh, You mentioned bowling. Anything else that you like to do? I love bowling with my kids. I -hmm. love going on hikes. I love nature. Um, I'm trying to get my kids to do more of that. Uh, I enjoy motorsports, very, very into cars and uh, mostly European cars. Uh, I'm a Volkswagen guy, mm-hmm. uh, Volkswagen, Audi, Porsche, all those. Um, I don't own a, an Audi or a Porsche, just for the record, but I do <laughs> have some Volkswagens. I, I enjoy my firearms, Tim. I do. And um, not, not because I'm in the military, but just because I, I enjoy the discipline of all the variables that go into marksmanship. So that's a cool thing. I I enjoy travel, Tim. I love going to different countries and different cities and I Mm -hmm. love people. Yeah, that's great. What about fishing being in Minnesota? 
Well, you know, it never caught on. I did it when I was a teenager. I've taken my son a few times. I probably should like it more. I probably <laughs> should, but I just, I, I don't know. Yeah. I just never got into it. I moved from, well, my parents moved from Minnesota when I was five. And so we went back there about five years ago. And I just remember flying over the state and seeing all the water. And I'm like, wow, because my dad oh, yeah. always talked about fishing growing up in Minnesota and, you know, the pike and all that kind of stuff that we used to fish for, which I don't remember. And so, but I'm, I've had horrible, horrible luck. <laughs> I've, I've probably gone on the last 10 fishing trips, which included deep sea, Minnesota, and a bunch in Arizona. And I think I've caught maybe one fish. So I See, like it, but great. it's definitely not uh, a skill I've, I've yeah. perfected. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. If you don't, if you're not catching fish, it just, it's just really not enjoyable. And yeah. I don't know, maybe I don't understand fishing or something. Maybe I've never been trained, but of course the exhilaration of catching a fish on the line is, is quite a rush, but oh yeah, for yeah, sure. Tons of lakes, no shortage of water. Yeah. This podcast is part of the edify podcast network. Edify is a faith inspiring app that brings together thousands of the best Christian podcasts in one place for your listening enjoyment. Cut through the noise and grow your faith by diving into the world's top Christian podcasts today. Download the Edify app for free from the App Store or Google Play or by going to edify.app. That's E-D-I-F-I dot app. Awesome. Well, I want to move on to the questions I ask all my guests where time you had godly discernment in your life. You know, you had a, a situation or a problem you were facing and how you heard from God or knew it was God. And then we'll also move on to a time you did not have uh, discernment and what you learned from it. So... Want to kick us off? Thing that stands out immediately to me was uh, Amir, my brother-in-law, Amir. He asked me to consider uh, joining him in uh, ministry. At that time, I was a full-time pastor, and it was not it was not an easy thing. <clears throat> um, and I initially said said no, or I'll think about it, and I never got back to him, which was kind of a no. And as the ministry grew, he he. Uh, he came back and um, and said, "Look, you know, now is the time. You need to decide. Otherwise, I have to. I have to. I have to find somebody." And I immediately went to the Lord in prayer. Immediately, and I think your listeners should know that that any major decision or even simple decisions that you just don't know, immediately just go to the Lord in prayer. You can do, you can right on the spot. You can say, "Lord, give me wisdom right now." Yeah. And uh, it wasn't that easy for me. I went to the Lord, but I still needed a lot of other layers, Tim, to discern truly. You have to, if you're married, you got to talk to your your spouse. You got to. You're in this together. You're you're one. You're one flesh. Mm -hmm. And if that's uh, if there's peace there, then I talked to some very close, trusted fellow believing, mature <laughs> believing friends. Yeah, and hear what they have to say. And at that time. I had to really work with my church. It was a seismic shift because leaving a lead lead pastor position, and I did it uh, fairly quickly. It it, it caused a, a chain of a lot of concerns and emotions of what what are we going to do now without a leader and how are we going to fill that? And so that's why I started out as a volunteer at first and then part time, then eased my way into it. And uh, the ministry was growing so fast that I went to the leaders and said, look, I can no longer serve in, in the pastoral role. It's overwhelming. So yeah. they were gracious to uh, commission me and release me. But that the discernment and major decisions, you get the privilege, if you so choose, to be proactive. Go to the Lord. Trust in your friend, uh, counsel of, of, of many. Even there's Proverbs written about that. And... Uh, and you ask, I asked God for signs, Tim. I, I, I asked God for signs. Yeah. Um, that's, that's something I'm comfortable with. Lord, show me. And uh, he did. He did. That's great. Yeah. That, and you hit on all the things I talk about with discernment. You know, we have to have a knowledge of the Bible, uh, uh, seeking the Holy Spirit and godly relationships. You talked about all those. And also what I say is a lot of times uh, discernment comes with just a piece of God about a decision. You know, if we're trying to force it, a lot of times we don't have peace about it. Even if it seems like the right decision, when you check off all the boxes in a, in a worldly kind of an analysis, you know, it might look good, but it's not necessarily 
God good. You know, it's not the the direction God is always leading us is not the one that, you know, when you put down the pros and cons, it's not always, and that's fine to do in our own knowledge, but we have to go to God, especially on the big decisions and make sure that we know where he's leading us. And then we have that peace that comes from it. And I love what you said too, just ask God about a, a sign or two, you know, Gideon did with the fleeces. And I always say that there's no harm in asking. And I've had God come through and 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 show up when I've asked for a, a sign of a fleece type of a sign and God has honored that. And now he doesn't always, but like I said, there's no harm in asking. And if he wants to show you a different way, then that's great. That's up to God. But at the same time, you're going before him with the request. Jesus said, ask and you shall find, seek and you will, and the door will be open, knock and the door will be open for you. And mm-hmm. so when it comes to discernment, we have to ask, you know, I, I talk about sometimes, you know, it's like the, the kids in the candy store that, you know, a grocery store, right at the end, you have those, those things that are at the eye level of kids, you know, the, the candy, the toys that are the last minute purchases. And I worked in retail for many years. And so you always see the, the kids begging their parents for a, a last minute candy or hot wheel car or something like that. And some of the parents say yes, some of them say no, but they still, the, the parent would have never just given it to them unless they asked. And so there is power in asking God for things. He likes to hear our heart. He likes to come through and, and give us the desires of our heart. And so, you know, it's important that we do use our words, that we do communicate to God through prayer, what we're, what we're interested in, and, and God honors that. I, I couldn't agree with you more, Tim. So tell us a story about a time you did not have the best discernment and kind of what you learned from that decision. Well, I regret that I have to live with this for the rest of my life. But when I was a pastor, we had other pastors as well, as you can imagine. One of them was not working out. And my lack of discernment was very simply not taking my concerns directly to this pastor. Mm. And uh, I admittedly sinned by going to others, and others came to me unsolicited. And everybody was trying to build a case and find out the truth of the attitudes and behaviors of this fellow pastor. And I succumbed to what I would call the sin of gossip and the sin of the fear of man. Mm. And uh, I was scared to go to him directly. I didn't uh, feel like I, I, I just made excuses. And I, I, I said too much to those around me uh, when he wasn't present. And this lack of discernment, which I knew the Bible said spe- specifically what to do in situations like that, when it hits you, Tim, and when somebody just shoots in from the side and they ask you about a person, it's very easy because of your emotions, mm. uh, even negative emotions, to want to participate in a false sense of justice by slamming someone behind their back. Yeah. What you've just done is you've created an infection within the body and a deep woundedness to the fellow pastor. And that fear of man um, lurks its head everywhere. You know, we want to please people. We want to be on good terms with everybody. So in either you save face, like in my case, or you redirect the frustration to another area. I think we all have that temptation. And, you know, you'd say, well, the Bible is very clear on how to confront a brother. Yeah. And yet everywhere I go in the world, it's not a practice that is it's not a common practice, let's just put it that way. Yeah. And so made a promise to myself to obey scripture in that from that point on, I learned some hard lessons when that fellow leader looked at me with tears and such disappointment in my whole my whole life. It was like the spirit of God brought conviction and said, Mike, you know he's right. Even if he's even if he's misbehaving, he's right. And uh learned from this. Yeah. And that, like you said, that's something that I've seen a lot too in the church where people will go to other people to try to fix someone else, uh, or they'll go to the pastor and say, would you fix this person? Right. And so yep, contract contracted out, you know, yeah. of lack of courage. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, I think pastors that are, are wise will say, have you gone to them yourself first? Right. Mm-hmm. And then, and then if nothing, if it's something that is damaging to the body, they could bring them in together. 
and try to work it out. Uh, so what would you say, you know, for people who do have conflict with someone else in a body, in a church, like what, what are the proper steps uh, apart from those, would you say? Well, I certainly learned a ton myself. And the, the answer for me every time to people is, oh, have you gone to that person? I assume you've gone to that person. If you're coming to me, then you, I'm sure you've gone to that person. Most of the time it's, oh, uh, no, um, I just, I just thought you should know. And I'm like, hold, no, hold on. It's too late for that now. Uh, when are you going to give me a date and time? Yeah. And, they, and if they say, oh, I, I'm not, I don't, I, I, it's enough. I I'll just forget about it. Well, no, hold on. Just a, just a minute. You brought this to me. This is obviously concerned that you would, if it wasn't a concern, you wouldn't have brought it to me. How about we, how about we make a meeting and I'll be with you together. And then you can express face to face to that person. I tell you, Tim, that is when it falls apart. People yeah. hate that. In our ministry, <laughs> people that have something against uh, us yeah. will go and make a a blog, or they'll publish something, or they'll get on a video and they will uh, speak about us. Yeah. And not a single email, not a single call, none, nada, zilch. It's a it's it's mind numbing. And these the some of these people are what I would call at least it appears to me to be up to that time, mature believers, but this is the lack of discernment that yeah. I think any believer can have. And I think it's the fear of man and, and, and really just wanting to want, wanting to avoid conflict. Yeah. And, and it's such a big issue in the church. And I think there's two sides of gossip. You have people who just enjoy the drama and then you have people who are well-meaning gossipers who who think they're actually doing a good by bringing it forward and not going to the person and in their mind they they uh, justify it but at the end of the day it's still gossip if you're if you're talking about someone behind their back if you're not trying to work it out if you just or if you just leave the church because you're upset and not try to do anything about it right those are all ways that we don't you know act upon the situation properly and try to resolve it as as brothers and sisters in Christ yeah it's sad and uh a lot of people do that, Tim, and it's not—it's not an American problem. It's a problem of every everybody in the world. I see yeah. this behavior. Yeah, awesome. Well, I want to move on to the next topic. Here is—is is the fact that you're passionate about teaching about the end times in Israel, which we talked about a little bit. So let's we'll start with the end times. This is often a, uh, a tricky subject for Christians to talk about, or, or maybe they just don't understand enough about it. But but why is it important to study eschatology? Well, because it's a lot of the portions of the Bible that speak about eschatology. If you're a believer and you believe the Bible, then believe the Bible. Don't believe 80% of the Bible, 70% of the Bible. End times shows us how this world is going to conclude and ultimately ends with the inevitability of Jesus on the throne. And it gives hope that no matter how much challenge we face, we know and we can have confidence that the end is already determined. Mm. And by the way, not only that, but there are many milestones, signs along the way that give us an idea just to how close we are to the times. And so our job is to equip the church worldwide and understand the prophecies. And the linchpin and the key to understanding all of that are the prophecies particularly pertaining to Israel, also known as the fig tree, Tim. Mm. Yeah. And there's a lot of misconceptions about the end times too. Uh, I'm sure you hear a lot of them as well. And there's such a wide range, I think, of different interpretations of the end times. But what are some misconceptions you've heard or that you have to constantly answer that you might like to speak about right now? Yeah. The first one, which is probably one of the biggest epidemics in the church, is the view that the church replaces Israel in the unfulfilled prophecies. In other words, these people actually believe that Israel's prophecies that have been fulfilled, more or less uh, literally, all those unfulfilled ones have now transitioned, will be fulfilled, and are being fulfilled by the church allegorically. Mm. Tim, did you know that the Holocaust Museum in Israel, it's, it's called Yad Vashem, the very first exhibit that you go into, is the brainwashing tactics of the Nazis. And you know what they did? They partnered with many of the church leaders and 
they got the nation to believe that God had deserted the Jews because of their disobedience and wow. his covenants are now only for the church. That's how Hitler sold this to the church. They could say with good conscience in, in their eyes that God is done with the Jews. They are now reprobates mm. and there's no need for them anymore. That's the worst end to replacement theology. At the very least, it triggers a chain reaction in horrible interpretation for the Bible. And it's a very hypocritical standpoint because we're going to allegorize things that weren't meant to be allegorized. What else are you going to allegorize? Yeah. What, el what else are you going to misinterpret? Right. How are you going to define sexuality? How are mm -hmm. you going to define marriage? How are you going to define the other absolutes? Okay. And now we find ourselves in a moral quandary as well. So, Tim, that's, uh, that's the big epidemic that I think uh, we constantly face. Replacement theology is what we call it. Yeah, and it, it's really the difference between understanding that we're grafted in versus replaced, right? I mean, that's kind of what the difference is where we believe that we are, we are blessed as, as Gentiles to be grafted into the promises of Israel versus, hey, it's all about us now and Israel's off the picture, right? Yeah, the Bible strictly warns about that. Romans 9 through 11. Just read those three chapters in one sitting. If it's not clear, I don't know what it's going to take to make it clear. The olive tree stands, the original olive tree, the promises, the covenants, the spiritual promises to Israel stands. The non-believing branches were cut off. Paul says it right there in the passage. And we, the filthy pig-eating Gentiles, were grafted in. And he says, do not assume that you, you, your, your status is of anything special. You are grafted in. God did it. And he did not uproot the olive tree, the original yeah. olive tree, Israel. But he left it because the covenant still stands and we get the privilege of being grafted in. That's it. Yeah. And it was a struggle for the Jews back then to, to accept that. Uh, the fact that Gentiles could be grafted in. That's something that Paul and Peter fought about a lot. and. Now it's like the opposite. Gentiles are having a hard time believing that Jews are, are part of the picture too. You know, it's like we've, we've flipped the script. Precisely. We as human beings have this tribal identity and anybody that does not believe the same way we do, we like to, uh, we like to keep them in the doghouse, so to speak. And it's wrong. It's sinful. And there's consequences. Right. And Israel still, you know, has to come to the saving knowledge of Jesus, right? They don't have a, a pass on that as far as salvation, but God still has plans for the country, the, the, the people of Israel in end times sequencing of events that will bring a lot of Israel, Israelites to the knowledge of Jesus through, uh, honestly, you know, trials and turmoil that will, you know, kind of get their thinking like, oh yeah, this is the Messiah that we've rejected, you know, the ones that haven't accepted Jesus. Well, I'm glad you brought that up, Tim, because you're talking about the metaphor of the fig tree. When Jesus was approaching Jerusalem uh, later in the gospel of Matthew, it's also, it also is, appears in the other gospels, but he curses the fig tree because it wasn't bearing fruit. And uh, you can imagine, wow, why? That seems so cruel. What is that? Well, mm -hmm. the fig tree represents the national uh, promises of Israel. And what he was saying is he's condemning the leadership, the ineffective temple. It's a dysfunctional uh, Judaism at the time. This was under Rome. And, of course, that's when he, he goes up to the Olivet and has the Olivet Discourse and talks about all of the events that are designed to bring Israel as a nation back to the Messiah, back to their Messiah. Yeah. And, uh, and then, he, then, the, then, then he says, learn the lesson of the fig tree. And the time is not yet, but it will come when the fig tree will blossom. And in 1948, Israel got its independence right after the Holocaust, which I believe is a fulfillment of Ezekiel 36 and 37, the dry bones, yeah. Holocaust, the nation. Mm -hmm. coming to uh, from the four corners of the earth. And, and, and by the way, Tim, we're seeing more and more people come to faith in Israel, mm. which is also part of Ezekiel 36 and 37. 
is it predicts that the spirit of God will come back in. But nothing's going to compare to the, the second coming at the end of the tribulation period, the seven-year tribulation period, where they will look upon him whom they've pierced and mourn for him. And that's when they will come to faith and realize, wow, Jesus was, is, and always will be our actual Messiah. Yeah. And so, yeah, so these, these you, you kind of hit, hit my, my passion here with that uh, <laughs> comment. I can't remember if it was in Amir's book or a different book, but basically, you know, there was a family that wasn't allowed to speak the name of Jesus because it was basically a curse word in Israel, you know, for, yeah. yeah. And, and the fact that once, once that person realized that, Hey, this, this, this Messiah, this is actually our Messiah that we've been looking for. And you've probably seen that too. And people you've witnessed to over there is that when you start connecting the dots, in the the Old Testament, the Torah of what they accept versus the fulfillment of that in Jesus, there's probably like a, a just a, a thousand light bulbs that go off in their head. Like, wow, I've I've never seen this for what it is. Right. I'll give you an example. Everyone refers to Jesus in Hebrew as Yeshu. It even grieves me to even say that word. His real name is Yeshua. Yeah. Okay. Yeshu is an acrostic. Uh, for may his name be blotted out. Mm, wow. Think about that. So everybody's running around referring to Jesus as may his name be blotted out, Yeshu in wow. Hebrew. And I'll give you a, one example of what can happen and how important uh, Jesus, Jesus' identity is. We're doing outreach once in the south. It's in the desert. There's a little, there's a village called Arad. Actually, it's a city now. It's grown a lot. And uh, I gave a New Testament to one of the interested Jewish, Jewish youngsters. And he opened it up, of course, to Matthew chapter one. And, and what do you find there? It's a uh, genealogy. Yeah. So he starts reading this. And I'm like, oh man, is that the right, greatest place for him to read? Oh, that could be boring. But he, his eyes were lighting up. He was looking at all these names of whom he was familiar with as a Jewish person, key people in his history. Mm. And then it comes to Jesus' name. Not only does it say Yeshua, but he's the son of David. And he looks at me with concern and he says, so Jesus was the son of David in the lineage of David? I said, absolutely. He said, I need to read more. And he went off. He took this New Testament. He read more. He read the, the first four Gospels in hours. He was just kicking butt, taking names. He was ripping right through it. He came back. And he had a gazillion questions, mm. but he stopped using the word Yeshu and started referring to him as Yeshua because he, he knew in his head what they had indoctrinated him with. And now he was awakened to who Jesus actually is. It's really cool to be able to see that, Tim. That's great. That's exciting to know that it may not even be that, you know, you don't have to study, you know, months to try to get the connection. Someone can just read a genealogy and get that connection. And so what, what would you say for people who do have Jewish friends? What is a good way to witness to them as far as explaining that Yeshua is their Messiah without being completely kicked out of, out of the, out of the household? Well, first you have to be humble and loving. I mean, we say that, but do we actually do that? So you have to be humble and loving. They, it, uh, I find most of my Jewish friends love to process. They don't like to be told what to believe. They like to process. They like to challenge and an even exchange. Mm. The advantage that we have in some senses is that we've really learned uh, a lot of the Hebrew. And if you don't know Hebrew, then learn the Messianic prophecies in the Old Testament about Jesus. And what I love to do is ask, what what do you think about this passage? Here in the New Testament, it interprets it as Jesus being the fulfillment. How do you understand this passage? Yeah. You know, and there are if you if you just Google messianic prophecies, it's going to bring up a gazillion messianic prophecies, okay? One of my favorites is Psalm chapter 22, Daniel chapter 9 verse 24 through 25 the latter part of Zechariah, because I get to talk about the, uh, the second coming. And of course, 
Ezekiel 36 through 39. Because when you get to chapter 38 and 39, it predicts a coalition of Iran, Turkey, and Russia just north of Israel that have plans to invade for Israel's resources. That's what gets a lot of people asking, wow, (laughs) this is already happening. Yeah. And uh, so it's, you got to be humble. You got to be concerned about the person rather, because they can, look, human beings in general know when you're trying to convert them. Yeah. It's a very arrogant standpoint if you think about it. That's not how Jesus operated. That is not how the apostles operated. They came in and they presented a case in a loving, respectful way. Paul, everywhere he went, he went to the synagogue first because he knew he had a foundation of understanding of the Bible. New Testament hadn't been written by that, but at that time. And so he had a foundation he could build on. And it says very specifically on numerous occasions in the book of Acts, they entered into question and answer periods. And they, he, it says he reasoned with them day and night. Yeah. Yeah. And I love the Bereans too. The Bereans took what Paul said and they searched the scriptures for themselves to see if it was true. And how much more is that discernment for, for anyone? Search the scriptures for yourself. Don't take what a pastor, preacher, teacher says uh, in, in verbatim and just you know, use that as maybe a, a kicking off point to, to search it for yourself and to see if what they're saying is true. And I love the fact that you know, all these things that we're seeing today, the fact that Israel, such a small piece of land in the Middle East is the most contentious piece of land and how, like you're saying, Russia, you know, uh, Iran, Turkey, all these countries that we know and the power they have and the hate they have for Israel has been prophesied, has been, has been stated in the Bible for, for thousands of years now. And just the the lack of coincidence in that alone should get people to think, okay, there is something important about Israel today. We can't just dismiss it. It's not just, it's not whatever you want to call it. It's something significant. It has a, has a purpose for the future. So that's exciting. And that's something we all need to keep in mind when we think about Israel. And also the fact that we look in the world today and, and we see we can see a lack of hope if we just look at it in our own perspective. If we're consuming the the media and what they have to tell us, we can can lose our hope. Even as Christians, it's hard, you know, in a year of 2020 and beyond to, to kind of lose sight of the fact that we are in the last days. And I love in Amir's book, The Day Approaching, how he talks about the coming apostasy and how we're seeing signs of that today. But how is this both a warning and hope when you see the apostasy in the world today, do you think? You know, can I use an illustration of a huge, let's just take Hoover Dam. Yeah. Picture Hoover Dam, this massive dam holding back the river. Imagine that the integrity of the dam starts to crack and there's water shooting out of cracks. I believe, we believe, As the Bible said, that in the latter days, people will have itching ears. They'll want to exchange the truth with with the lie. They'll they'll have cultural values. They'll have a lot of confusion with sexuality, with right and wrong. And we see all that happening. So the dam is cracking, and it's cracking fast. And it seems like things are moving in that direction much faster than any other time period in history, Tim. Internationally, I'm not just speaking within within the parameters of the United States, but speaking in the last 100 years, and especially where we're at right now with the world globalist culture, the one world government and all this, that dam is going to crack, 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 and there's going to be all kinds of water flying through it. And then we believe that apostasy of the cracks in truth and the breaches within exchanging truth for lie, creating fake realities, wanting to join the world and its values, you know, cult, the, the climate change, uh, you know, idolatry hill, you know, yeah. open borders for all. Let's join hands and sing Kumbaya and, <laughs> and treat the country as if you treated it at a church, you know, mm-hmm. People are exchanging values that don't belong in these arenas, and it's just going to end. And the the church itself is embracing a lot of these so called movements that want to render social justice, would have an evil agenda with a sticker tag no one can disagree with. And what you end up with, Tim, is the church exchanging good Bible truth because they want to fit in 
They want to have respect from their friends in the world. And they inadvertently, maybe even unaware, sell out. Yeah. But then when the church is taken, the dam collapses and the world gets everything they want. Yeah. And I call that the great apostasy. And it's on our YouTube channel. I gave a teaching on the great apostasy mm. because the believers aren't going to be in politics to dictate law or push yeah. back. They're not going to be in education. They're not going to be in finance. They're not going to be in the military. They're not going to be flying aircraft. They're not going to be in, in medicine. They're going to be gone and they're not going to influence anymore or hold back evil decisions. Now you're going to have not just cracks in the dam, but the dam blows out. Yeah. I hope that illustration helps. Yeah, that's great. And, and God even lifts his hand off of the world at that time and the Holy Spirit is lifted off. And if, if we think it's bad now, imagine if, God, if, if God's Holy Spirit is no longer sustaining, <laughs> is sustaining us in any way and what that looks like. I can't, that's, that's definitely a time of great trial. Can I say one thing about discernment? We have the Bible. We also have tools like Behold Israel that report on what's going on. We're not the only ones. Mm -hmm. To discern is to have a foundation of truth already, a reference point, so that anything else that conflicts with that, you deploy the discernment skills of what's right and wrong and make your choice accordingly of what you're going to believe. But the, the, the immediate challenge is going to be the fear of man. The fear of man. Yeah. What are others going to think if I believe this way? Will I still have the same friends? Will I still have the same opportunities? And the answer may be not. But you have to stand before God, either with a clean conscience or miss, missing out on. I'm not going to play anymore. Coming back to the horrible discernment that I deployed when it came to gossiping and not going to my fellow pastor. These days are going to require courage and faith, Tim. But, yeah. but if you take away the truth, it's only inevitable that you're going to be led away. Yeah, that's awesome. And I want to I want to end on that just to give some hope to to Christians on how they can have God's heart for Israel today, including praying for the salvation of Jews who don't yet know Jesus. How can Christians not only have God's heart, but be connected. What are some resources you have and, and any, any ways they can connect with you in, in the ministry? I don't want to make you think that I'm, I'm giving you a trite answer, but a lot of us can't go to Israel. Even, if, even pre-corona, it's very expensive to go to Israel. And that, that probably is probably one of the best ways to see with your own eyes, to behold that which is Israel. Yeah. But what if your listener prayed right now, God... Show me how you view Israel and what's at stake if I don't view them the way you view them. If you pray that prayer genuinely, you're going to find he's going to guide you to different sources. There, there will be a metamorphosis that occurs and your eyes will slowly like scales coming off. You're going to see the prophecies. You're going to see what God is doing in Israel. You're going to see the plans. You'll be reading in your Bible and things will pop out at you. And you're going to say, wow, I can't believe I ever. And you'll get excited. You'll get yeah. excited because these times that we live in and Israel's role will give you confidence that you're in the correct faith and that you're reading the correct word of God. You're not reading the Quran or the Bhagavad Gita or something yeah. else. You're reading the truth, mm. and it's going to excite you because Israel is that layer that gives you that, that added, supercharged nitrous oxide faith so that you can really understand, wow, I'm living in the day when we see the fig tree, Israel blooming. This isn't just uh, sensationalism. This is actual. Yeah. And uh, Lord, allow me to see Israel the way you see them. Guide me. And my, my, my friend, Tim, he will, he will do it. He will. Yeah. I can absolutely guarantee you he will. That's exciting. And I love that analogy and uh, just exhortation at the end that, you know, just seek out the information. And, and from that, you'll know that you're kind of on the right side of all this mess and uh, that God has a plan and that, uh, you know, what the Bible has said thousands of years ago is coming true before our eyes. So what is the website and uh, where can people connect with you? Beholdisrael.org. 
And we have a channel on YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram. And the new and exciting thing that I said earlier is if you go to Telegram, we're on there as well. And that's where you really get the news and the real-time updates. And you, we, will, we will give you the truth instead of the fake news. So <laughs> beholdisrael.org and all of the social media sites, just type in Behold Israel. It's the logo uh, where it looks like a Jewish uh, star. And you'll probably see Amir Tzofati attached to it as well. Awesome. Thanks so much, Mike, for coming on. God bless you and your ministry. Thank you, Tim. It's been an honor. That's going to do it for today. Thanks so much for being here and listening to this podcast and supporting what I am doing. If you'd like to follow me on social media, you can search for Discerning Dad on just about every social media platform, biggest ones being Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter. And be sure to subscribe so you don't miss an episode. Next week, I'm talking to Tyler Smith. He is an NBA sports writer, a coach, and an author. He wrote the book called Searching for Seven about intimacy with Jesus all week long. And I think you're going to enjoy that episode as well. Until next week, go with God, grow in discernment, and keep your eyes on Jesus. Thank you for listening to the Everyday Discernment Podcast. For more information on Discerning Dad, go to discerning-dad.com. Be sure to follow on all the social media platforms. Just search for Discerning Dad. Please share this podcast with a friend and leave an honest review on whichever platform you listen. Feel free to send any comments, suggestions, questions, or prayer requests at discerningdad at outlook.com. Until next time. Keep fighting the good fight.